Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that introduction. So good afternoon and a warm welcome to all of you, all the viewers who are joining us. I'd like to start by saying a big thank you to FOED and the organizing team for driving this event and including lighting design as a key topic in this forum. Still a new specialist dis discipline relatively, lighting design is rapidly gaining acceptance for the value it brings to our spaces, our physical and our emotional well-being. The topic for discussion today, lighting design, a science and an art, is actually a very vast topic, as all of you know, and it warrants more than the R that we have. But we are trying to approach this from a practical and experiential perspective with a distinguished and many more questions. You to send in your questions, which we'll try to take with the panelists in the second half of the talk. We'd be happy to share your thoughts, your perspectives with everyone. Let's make this more engaging. So I'd like to introduce the first panelist, architect Amit Gupta. Amit is the founder partner of the firm Studio Symbiosis. He's a postgraduate from the prestigious Architectural Association of London. He has worked for Zaha Hadid Architects in London, where he was involved in several award-winning projects. Studio Symbiosis was started in 2010 by Amit and his architect wife, Tarno Gupta. In a very short span of time, they have won many accolades and recognitions. They have offices in Germany and the UK. Defining the term symbiosis, the firm says, elements of program, site, context, landscape, and climate are studied and interfaced, thereby resulting in the amalgamation of these design considerations in one coherent design and resonating the term symbiosis in the design. And I'm hoping that after today, Amit would be happy to add light to this list. So over to you, Amit. Thanks, Lord Kauru. Thank you, Gaurav. Thank you for the warm introduction. And thank you for it for really organizing this interesting topic about light and architecture. And of course, light is a very essential component of architecture because it eliminates one of the five senses with which we perceive a space. So that's why it's very interesting to be part of this panel. Thank you, Gaurav. You're welcome. The stage is yours. Yeah. So in terms of lighting as an element which creates a space, like I was saying, it's one of the elements which can help you perceive a space. And as a designer, we're looking at lighting in terms of various aspects, not just um, creating an object in space, but also to create a very performance-based spaces. So lighting, we are looking at both aspects of lighting, which is artificial daylighting, artificial uh, lighting as well as daylighting and how we can control and uh, play with these two elements to create a space. So let's say in one of the projects which we had done, which is Punjab Kisri headquarters, so their light was the design driver for the entire project. So there we did a lot of lux level calculations and through design we made sure that the spaces are getting around 500 lux level on workstation level. So this itself became the design driver for the entire project. The light was the basis and the genesis of everything in that case. Then, of course, in other projects, if we speak about India, it's a very hot climate. So we need to be careful about the balance between light and heat, how we are managing these two conditions. Because, of course, glass is a very good aspect to catch natural light. But then in a country like India, it also means a lot of heat which is coming in the spaces. So in this aspect, we're also looking at creating a combination between the systems where the light is let through, but through elements of cantilevers, through water bodies, through other things, we're trying to create an ambient temperature. So in a sense, any element of architecture, we don't look at individually. It's of course a coherent, um, you know, how these all these elements speak to each other in terms of human comfort, in terms of lighting, in terms of structure, MEP, which creates really a sustainable architecture. And then going forward, uh, Gaurav, if you would share the slides now, or you're sharing them later. Oh, um, yeah. so this is the. This is good, Gaurav. The second one is good. Okay. Yeah. 
Can you see those slides? Yeah, it's just loading. Okay. So in terms of another project, so this is a headquarter tower which you're doing in Mumbai Central. This is due to open this year. Would have already opened if it was not for the situation we are in. So in this case, light was very important in terms that the lower part of the building is offices. So to cut down the heat gain, we have put this jali pattern. So we are reducing the heat gain of the building. And then these calligraphic strokes, they go vertically up and upper parts are all residential. So in a way, and also the images which we produced and designing wise, so light and the pixelation of the light on this lower part of the building becomes a very key element. And also this vertical Tron lights, they help us in accentuating the verticality of the tower. The thing is light in the night sky can become a very dominant aspect in terms of creating a skyline of a city and also creating a presence of a building in the city fabric itself. Um, so Gaurav, if you can please go next. Uh, this project is, um, so we are doing a couple of train stations in India. And in train stations, the biggest challenge is getting natural light inside the station because you have very big flow plates. So this is Gwalia train station, which we are working on. And the component itself, so let's say lighting as an architectural element. So again here, light was very critical for us to make a sustainable building. If we would make a very big span building without any light condition coming from outside, it means using artificial light and it's all counterproductive. So it was also a fusion in terms of how light can be filtered through a space. So we can we have a lot of repertoire in terms of architects, you know, how we can manage light. So here it was more about uh, creating this Jali patterns, which are also localized to relates to the culture of Gwalior. So it's not something which is, you know, which you can place anywhere in the world. We believe that architecture and how we deal with it should be very localized and be crafted in the site itself. So here light was this light cones which are coming and it's a modular system, it's a station building. So we're managing 32, cantilever, 32 meter cantilever from the module, but with a system where the light is integrated in the form itself. Gaurav, could I request you for the next one, please? Uh, this is uh, another project we're doing in Bombay. So this is a residential tower in Varsova, which looks at the seafront. So here for us, light and views were two elements which you're looking at. So this becomes not just a piece of architecture or a housing project, but it's a very dominant scale in the cityscape, like you see in the image on the left. So for us, it was not just the lighting from inside, but also how the light bounces on the building itself. Now, architecturally, what you see on the right, so we have a complete glass facade, which is facing the sea, and on the sides, it's solid to ensure that we are cutting down the heat. So in a way, we are trying to also create a balance in terms of how much heat goes in. And then one thing which we're using was we're rotating the floor plans. And by doing this, we're getting this ripple effect on the facade, which actually helps us in uh, creating this very interesting jewel-like effect on the facade, which, uh, you know, it also depends on how the light hits a surface. So if it's a pixelated facade, the facade itself becomes like a pixel screen, which reflects our sun setting or the various times of the day. So to conclude, I think for us, lighting is very integral because light is how we perceive space anyway. This is the one thing which enables us in perceiving the space. And then coming to the other aspect of light, which is artificial lighting. This again should correspond and integrate in the architectural features and be related to natural lighting. So these two things should go really hand in hand of how we are creating architectural spaces. So, Gaurav, uh, yeah, this is my take on the topic. Right. Well, that's that's wonderful. Thanks for sharing these wonderful project photos, uh, Amit. So, I have a couple of questions for you and uh, for our audience. You've you've got this very interesting design language, you know, where you are looking at the generation of form through you know very scientific, very mathematical means. You're incorporating a lot of context. You're talking about light. Uh, you know, while you're rotating the floor plans for this building per se. So uh, is light something, the design of light that you start with from the, you know, the first thing on the drawing board or does it develop as part of an iterative process? See, light is of course one of the very important parts, but it's um, in architecture, we're of course looking at a lot of different aspects. We're looking at efficiency, floor plates, views. So light is one of the elements, but um, of course, it's something which is not a byproduct. 
you know, light or any part of architecture cannot be an afterthought. So we are trying to integrate this at the concept design stage itself. So it is uh, not something with which we might start every project. So Punjab case, we started exactly with light, but it really depends on the design brief. If you're doing a housing project, we'll focus more on the densities and the views and condition of living, but it has to be integrated at the concept itself. Okay. And how do you factor in, because there is a pretty strong design language, how do you factor in, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm trying to come back to the topic because the topic is lighting design, science, and art. So how do you factor in some critical components of the scientific aspect of lighting, such as So Gaurav, I think, uh, yes, uh, you were you broke there for a second. So answering yeah. your question in terms of how we deal with this, light is very difficult to figure out. And mock-up is the only way to go about it. So at times, we're also looking at elements of, let's say, in Hilton Kathmandu, we're using a dichroic glass. So we have fins which are illuminated during the day through natural light and in the night through artificial light. But I think lighting is such a critical aspect that you know, renderings and other things cannot help us. It's only through physical mockups that we understand the performance and uh, the performance of the lighting on the particular building once it's up. So the best way is to go about it is first to a lab test to figure out, let's say go 50% of the way or 60% of the way, and then do a physical mockup on the site itself and then test it, how the light is falling on the building. I'm speaking about facade lighting right now to be more particular. Interior lighting would be a bit different case. So mock-up is the way to go, I think, for us. That's how we see it. OK, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for uh, giving us this feedback. I'd like to move on. Uh, we'll come back to you when we do more questions and answers. Uh, sure. I'll move on to our second panelist, um, Anusha. And uh, Hi, Laura. Hi. So let me introduce uh, Anusha. So Anusha is an undergraduate. Uh, she has an undergraduate degree from uh, in architecture and a master's degree in architectural lighting design from Wismar, Germany. She has worked for integrated lighting design in California for over nine years and has started her own studio lighting spaces since 2015. For Anusha, bringing in visual complexity through simple light vision. She was selected for the 40 under 40 Lighting Design Awards UK 20. So congratulations, Anusha, on that. Thank you. So Anusha, let's move, uh, you know, to to some of your work which you would like to share with the audience. Yes, uh, I'm going to begin uh, uh, to start. Sorry, I'm hearing my echo of myself. Uh, we can hear you. There's a little bit of echo. We can hear you. So I'm going to start by uh, talking about my approach to light and lighting and build spaces. Uh, the way I, as an architect, I know the way lighting has to be applied is understanding the context, the canvas that we are given from the parent architect. And, uh, you know, how is it perceived? And, uh, you know, what is the story behind each space? What is the function? What is the building typology? Um, uh, how are users going to go through this space? And uh, you know, understanding the the uh, framework of the context. Then second is the architect's thought process. So, what was the architect's thought process or story behind the whole context? And uh, that sort of gives me the cues as to how I can design lighting around it. And predominantly, I believe that lighting and architecture as a as one, it should be seen as one, and it is just the space that should say the story rather than light, you know? So that to me is the win-win uh, uh, situation for both lighting and design in one, architectural design in one. And that's how I see all my projects. And uh, how lighting gets efficiently designed in built spaces is when um, it gets seamlessly integrated. It, it just, you cannot separate one from the other. And, and that's the best way in which it can actually tell a powerful story. 
Uh, I'm going to show you five different contexts um, of projects uh, as how in each context my thought process has differed uh, uh, in treating lighting and build spaces in combination. Now, the first slide is a retail store. Uh, this is a diamond jewelry store, Titan Zoya and Bangalore. And um, here, uh, the whole idea is about one, user experience, two, is visual merchandise, and three is, you know, the client, client appearance as how uh, they interact with the visual merchandise, that's the jewelry, and how, like, you know, they have trials where they wear it themselves and see themselves on the mirror. So uh, in, in the end, it's also the, uh, the user who gets visually modeled there in, in front of the mirror. So there are, like, so many different angles to it. And then follows... The, the space in which this whole merchandise is being displayed. So here I would put that like, you know, visual merchandise in the first hierarchy when I started to design. And um, if you see here, uh, like, you know, the whole idea was not to completely flood the space with the light, not to completely flood, flood the space with fixtures either, where the fixture just does the job of what it needs to do. And uh, you have a lot of clear glass which in itself is a, a, a glare point and it's um, veiling reflection. So dealing with all that and make uh, the merchandise to have that brilliance on it and like, you know, bringing them to focus. So uh, uh, that's how this store was detailed and, um, you know, very uh, small fixtures. They were just like three inches by three inches slots where the fixtures went in into magnetic profiles, such a way that they are also flexible to flexible uh, uh, displays. Uh, and, and there are also, if you, in terms of see the architectural language, you have the visual merchandise as the first hierarchy, the second one are, uh, are the wall displays, uh, and then the third in the hierarchy is those subtle coves or the subtle washes, vertical washes that are there on the verticals. And uh, this sort of subtly defines the volumes that, you know, the, the user goes into. The next slide, please, Gaurav. And in this, this is a context where in a, a big office building, uh, I was called in to like, design lighting for an experience center. This is typically a software uh, context where they take their VCs, like, you know, only board of directors, they go into meetings, they go into presentations, they pitch projects, and they wanted a unique experience. So here, if you see how the context is set is that uh, the architectural detailing, the interior uh, elements, the interior materials, those sort of come into foray and uh, how delicately the film on the right image has been detailed in such a way that you have that subtle silhouette on the front and then the sides of the film being lit. So you kind of get to model each of the material in real time with light. So to me, as how um, a, a form or a built space has a shape, right? So to me, light as well has a form and a shape on its own. And it's, it's us lighting designers who sort of effectively control it and sort of manipulate it in a very nice way and sort of present them out. To me, light fixture is only an enabler. So how a fixture uh, sort of puts the light out. So that form to me is interesting. How is the resultant light? and how I can deal with it in a space. And if you see here in this particular context, none of the down lights are seen. So how the selection of the down lights, or where do I just rightly put them so that all my tasks are illuminated. If you see the tasks, they are like thoroughly illuminated without having to see those like holes on the ceiling. And uh, uh, all of those components of indirect lighting being used here so that you don't get building reflection on the backlit screens that are on the verticals. Next, uh, next slide, please, Gaurav. This is a bar in uh, Radisson Blue in Marathahalli, Bangalore. And uh, in this particular context, it is about a user experience. You sort of really twist their perception to give a unique experience in this bar. This is actually a very versatile bar that can also be used as a lounge in the daytime, lounge bar in the daytime. And then uh, at na late night, it, it is used as a nightclub. And uh, actually, we had a, a very unique uh, this thing that uh, in case this large space could be given out for meetings, which is actually a contrast and context, right? So I had to deal with like four different ball games here. Now, if you see here, the uh, light lines are those that 
delineate this space and the diffuse light i mean uh, in contrast to what we see in bars right like um they have those narrow spots like the usual stereotype but here we were talking about the light lines that are happening and that sort of defines the vertical and the horizontal there and how diffuse light can be subtly manipulated in such a way that it does not overwhelm the space and actually uh, in the meeting room scene there are some down lights very carefully tucked in and you cannot even spot them because it goes into the the crest part of it where the ac grills are and very cleverly put in such a way that you don't even see them and each scene goes by in a very uh, like seamless mode one scene from the other you don't even realize that this space has so many usages next slide please uh this is a completely different very playful project this is called playroom uh, or spark as their business identity goes but uh, in chennai and uh, here uh, the architect had a very unique uh, representation to me that this space is going to be defined by colors like overwhelming colors so how do i deal with colors and so you have all the uh, in a, in in a form right all the both the verticals and horizontals get defined with one color so you are dealing with mono color situation and how do those edges get defined so that that was the most most important defining factor how i chose the lighting for this particular context and this is more a uh, uh, an activity center for children so you actually need that task lighting you don't need overwhelming accent lighting spot lighting those kind of things and as well as i needed to Uh, uh sort of define this space that has color that has overwhelmingness without any edge definitions so i drew inspiration from dan flavin's lighting artwork where you you, know, you you keep on seeing two surfaces and there is like a fluorescent or a vertical that sort of separates and defines the two surfaces and it subtly washes it so that was a start point and if you see uh, there is a yellow room there is a red room there is a blue room there is a green room each one telling its own story and where well there was the verticality that needed to be emphasized verticality was emphasized and then uh, like wherever i be needed to create these playful patterns on the ceiling or on the wall so each uh, it was actually just a small 2500 square feet space but each volume of the space talks a story and uh, each like you know the playfulness uh, playing to the context next slide please this is a very subtle heritage project in uh, thrissur in kerala this is called ramnalayam and uh, here uh, this is a very silent approach to lighting design where you just leave the heritage structure to speak for itself basically and the material they just just glow and and just mod, uh, modulate the forms that are there and the materials that are there in a very quiet way you know you, the the effort is that you don't spot where the fixtures are coming from where the equipment are but you just see the heritage space this is actually a century old building you just see the heritage space just glowing and uh, visual form modeling it gives a very unique identity visual identity as well to this heritage space next slide please this is again a bar in ritz carlton bangalore uh, where uh, this is an application of colored or saturated light so light uh, as its own uh, yes we we do have like you know wall colors paint colors and material colors but this is we are talking about saturated colored light saturated colored light when is is kind of used out of context or uh, without control um, it becomes very overwhelming for the both the users in the space it can actually make or break the space so here it was a very very subtle usage where uh, it's more actually just a slick co application and directly the acrylic tubes just just catch this a uh, saturated light and just becomes a ceiling accent more than anything else and the little part of it gets reflected back as a subtle reflected light where those walls the glass uh, were made of frosted glass blocks and it has this subtle warm vertical glow that comes in as a contrast so that the blue does not get very overwhelming and you just have you know uh, small light like, table lamps and candles that are happening here that just defines the bar and the ends so again a bar is also about more a perceptual experience rather than a task oriented approach to light so i just wanted to show these six different approaches where you know it is a combination of several different things it is um, 
both a science in the form of understanding light as a uh, as as a natural element or a, as a you know as a component by itself and uh, builds the structure or its context for a whole right thank you so much those are amazing projects i really enjoyed uh, the playroom especially you know i wish uh, you know we could see more of that i'm sure the uh, children using that would be really really excited you know so thanks thank so you. much for sharing so i see a lot of um, um, you know interesting uh, types of light that you're using uh, but i would presume that uh, you're working primarily with leds or rather only with leds nowadays you know using all these different kinds of light colored light white light you know so so i want to understand because you're using your thing uh, you know or rather adapting uh, the application of light based on the project type so would you agree that with leds you can do practically everything or do you face some challenges you wish you know the technology today was uh, helpful for you to do something else which you are not able to achieve uh, that's a very good question karo i think uh, it has both its advantages and disadvantages uh, the one problem uh, now, now i would just talk about technological benefits is that uh, these days yes you know led gives in a lot of possibilities as to what their applications can be uh, the detailing are becoming smaller and smaller and it is becoming more easier to integrate them without having to uh, wonder about how big uh, you know is the space going to take like you know uh, the equipment going to take um, uh, and we are able to do more versatile things with light and uh, the possibilities that leds are bringing in but unfortunately the market has uh, overgrown so much in a very short duration of the time that uh, you know you you see uh, rapid technology that gets phased out in a matter of like couple of years like you know 3 years and 4 years so when we talk about a life cycle of a project right uh, we always are in a very we uh, as lighting designers we take a very very safe stand in terms of writing in specification because the specification that goes out of my office to my projects are a responsibility because like you know you kind of recommend something to the owner that this is a technology you want to buy so that uh, is something like we always take care that this is a time tested uh, you know product that may not get phased out or if uh, you know like uh, you know it, it is not something brand new that is untested um uh, to, before bringing it to a mainstream specification so these are some very careful uh, balances that a lighting designer need to look at in my opinion thank you thank you very much for that we'll come back to you with more questions so i'm going to move um, to my next speaker uh, just a moment so we are going to be speaking to parvez alam can you see my screen parvez yes i can okay so our third panelist is parvez alam parvez alam is the founder principal of synthesis uh with studios in london and delhi synthesis is an architecture and interior design firm he has a masters from the university of glasgow uk and uh, his studio synthesis advocates a rigorous reality based design process uh, ultimately the final product from pervez's studio is completely inform and generate the design So, Pervez, to you, your thoughts on this topic and your work, please. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Basically, as an architect, for me, I haven't uh, formally any done any studies on lighting, artificial lighting designing. I would uh, specifically say that. But uh, as an architect, we have always studied from the first semester how to take light and ingress the light of any interior or outdoor spaces. We have been studying light since uh, then. and lighting is a vital element while designing any space and designing light is actually an ancient sign from long time whenever the building up being made we consider light so for me lighting starts from the natural light first and then comes the minimum requirement of light in any spaces we have an in standard as per nbc the nbc regulates the lux level of different spaces that what uh, which space need to have minimum lux level 
uh, starting from toilet staircase to any study room or your any any kind of room any kind of interior spaces the lust level is defined by Indian standard in national care building codes so that's also we have been studied but now uh, the world is moving towards more research oriented futuristic system in everything and uh, technology is moving in every front and lighting is one of them where we can artificially design the light in absence of natural light obviously in absence of natural light we would need some light well, first thing comes the minimum requirement for that function what we need and then comes the deliberate intent to design a space considering the light and enhancing two things basically by light we are creating something or we are enhancing something with the light and these are two things that this has to be in both natural and artificial. And the lighting that what we are discussing here right now is more towards artificial lighting design, which is required in absence of natural light. And to me, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, I really enjoy working on but my take was generally remains the final outcome that what I'm looking, what I'm uh, I want to do with my project, what I'm, I'm doing. So I have always we take the help of the specific lighting designers. We just give them our intent and the objective towards the project. Like this is one of the uh, building which was actually surrounded by the high rise towers. So generally what happens that uh, these small buildings in the center are for eye source when we see from the top. So we designed a specific skin which was uh, a translucent skin uh, and it is uh, it has got light from the back so that it looks like the jewels set in the center of campus in the evening and night times. So this was the intent on the right hand side which, uh, which we thought and I actually realized it, it's in Gurgaon. If you see these abstract lines, these were derived from one of the natural site uh, at uh, Belfast, uh, and that's Giant Cosway. That's a natural site. So it's been the, the idea was uh, inspired from there. So the building glows all over, on all, all three sides. Even this uh, top is uh, glowing, sides are glowing. So this. Uh, uh, I mean, basically, this was the idea to okay, design the building so that it looks like a jewel center is set in the center of campus. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Oh, yeah. Basically, these are two options of a building. These are both residential building, and uh, one is on the modern side and one is on the traditional colonial building. How we can enhance basically my idea was to enhance all the elements which we have given which are generally uh, hidden in the absence of natural light like if you see on the right hand side this building this is traditional building and the nice will happen if you take light and uh, all these elements on the facade they get hidden in the evening and night times and only the light is coming from the inside windows so my intent was to enhance all the elements like cornices on all three levels. If you see these uh, all three levels, the cornices are enhanced and the cornices are, is having a hidden light, which is enhancing the texture on the building and also all, all the elements of the building. So basically for interior and exterior, both for me as an architect, uh, we understand three layer of lighting. The one is the minimum architectural light, which is required. Then we go move on to the light which is required for enhancing any element or dimming or basically controlling the intensity of light for the different modes then we come on the decorative light so similarly on the facade also if you see that there is uh, one light which is required then comes your light which enhances all the elements then the bracket light which is basically decorative light at on the lux level but enhancing the right feature which is required then on the modern modern building side, if you see, then again, it a uh, modern building is in the city, it's in uh, South Delhi. It is uh, finished now. So there were some abstract elements which, uh, if there was no uh, light, then they would look like a very regular thing in the night time. So to enhance them, the light was required in the abstract form only, not the simple enhancing. So if you see in the main portal, we have got abstract lines which is creating different surfaces. So the light has to come from different directions so that all the surfaces are enhanced and it can be read easily distinctively. In the absence of natural light and 
Yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you. And then comes, they, to me, these pictures are looking very hazy. I'm not sure that how others can see them. Anyways, in interiors, if we talk of interior, this is a project in South Delhi. So if we see that minimum the minimum required light from the ceiling, the architectural light, which is again controlled with the intensity, that is uh, right uh, light manda uh, mandatory light which is required in any interior spaces. Then comes your decorative light, or like if you can see on the top of dining table, that is decorative light, which is only spare required for the specific area and a specific uh, mood of co color. Can you move on to the next slide, please? Then the art gallery, an art gallery, again, art gallery or uh, any retail store, these are very specific areas where lighting design becomes a vital element in it. This is a saffron art gallery at uh, colleges. Again, if you see that every all the finishes uh, inside the flooring walls and everything was kept on the lighter side just to basically lighter on the emphasis that they don't carry more of an emphasis and only artwork is uh, enhanced with the light and lighting fixtures obviously they have to be a little hidden not uh, coming um, like lighting fixtures shall be uh, hidden and they are not uh, carrying that more of a weightage in their or, or overall canvas so only the artwork is, should be enhanced that was the idea behind this and also the lighting uh, basically lighting carries different parts lighting design can explain better than me that uh, how we can do that but my intent to be uh, explained to my lighted lighting designer was that we want to see the artwork in a natural light so the lighting can be uh, now with the futuristic advancement of the light of, there are fixtures which gives light which imitates actual natural light and also we can control the colors what we want in terms of the in colors of white different shades of white and also we can move on to different colors like changing the colors blue green red that is possible now and uh, basically here it was natural light that we wanted a, uh, wanted to imitate a natural light for every artwork specifically then again a designing basically designing light fixtures and light both so many of our projects, we have custom designed the light fixtures with the light in it. This, this is one of the restaurant at Daba by Clarages. <clears throat> there are, I think, uh, four or five of them were done by us. So initially, all the lights were custom designed for this properties, even the light, light fixtures. Uh, these were in collaboration with Globe Design. If you see on the right, this is basically a glass hand layer. And uh, the other lights on the wall, if you see, these are all hand-blown glass. Hello. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. So basically, this is the next. This was the intent from our side. We designed these lights, and the lighting designer was helping us with the light which comes in and give the right, right effect, which was desired in this space. Right. So, Parvez, thanks, thanks a lot for sharing uh, these images. I mean, again, a fantastic range of uh, projects and. Uh, I love the collaboration that you are uh, showing between yourself and the lighting designer and working with uh, craft, you know, as we see in this picture. So uh, I, I want to ask you, you know, how do you get inspiration for this? Is this something that uh, you develop as part? You, you mentioned a very layered approach, you know, where you talk about flux level, you talk about the mood you create, and finally coming to the decorative uh, fixtures, you know, or the instruments that uh, are part of this space. And they leave a very uh, strong, uh, lasting impression, you know, in the memory of the, the, the patron who's visiting these restaurants. So, so how do you come up with this? Uh, actually, it starts from the idea of, uh, basically, if we're doing a French restaurant, I would like to study the 
French interiors, all the elements from the historical ancient or the cuisine, whatever the cuisine is, or whatever the space is, whatever space, all the space for whom we have to design, we try to study the history and about them. Then we pull out elements from there, the, what are the elements, how we can infuse those elements in the interiors. The, uh, this kind of thing, like this eclectic thing uh, starts from there. But other things like when we talk of uh, exterior facade, again, and facade comes uh, obviously from the desire, uh, start from the client's desire, what he want, what he's looking for, if he's looking for a modern thing or a traditional thing or something specific is looking or the design starts from the desire of client only. And we try to help them realize their desires with our expertise and skills that we have acquired in a long span of time of our working. Basically, it doesn't, uh, the thought doesn't ignite from us. Thought is ignited from the client or the vision of the client, what he's looking for, and we help them reach there. Thank you, I'd like to quickly move our fourth panelist, uh, Ranjit uh, Give me a moment. So Ranjit Kartha is the founder and principal designer at Vega Lighting Designs and Systems Private Limited. He's based out of Bangalore. He brings in over 15 years of entrepreneurial experience in lighting design and product development in India, the UAE, and the US. Uh, Ranjit holds a master's degree in lighting from LRC and Rensselaer Polytechnic, Troy, New York. He also holds a postgraduate certificate in business management from XRI Jamshedpur and a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Bharatiya University, India. Ranjit is passionate about teaching and has delivered talks and workshops. Ranjit to introduce his work and his thoughts on the topic lighting designs, the science, and an art. Over to you, Ranjit. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Gaurav. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Hello. Yeah, okay. Thanks. So, uh, thanks, Gaurav, for that uh, introduction. Uh, so when uh, we had this topic, I, I was initially kind of going, taking a few steps back to really understand, uh, do, I, do we as lighting designers, you know, where do we really make that differentiation between science and art, you know, at what process or at what stage of our thinking process does this art element come in? Uh, and where is the starting of that? journey of thinking about a project from an artistic point of view. Uh, so something which I've been, I mean, deeply trying to understand better, for, especially for this uh, presentation, because uh, I think as practicing lighting designers, we really don't uh, switch on and off from a science mode to an art mode or vice versa. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a natural flow. Uh, but for the context of this, I thought, okay, let's see how what does art really mean for a society and uh, and what is the importance of lighting design as an artistic expression uh, of a society's journey you know uh, or so and what should art really do you know if i'm using lighting as a medium what should, what is the purpose and what should it actually do for the user and uh, the client so that's something which uh, i thought i'll think deeply uh, during this uh, conversation uh, so what I felt is that art, I mean, if you look at art generated, I mean, or originated uh, right from when men started scribbling on caves, I, I wouldn't call scribbling, but in that time it was art. So, uh, you know, on caves and, you know, wherever they had surfaces. So there was al already this body of, so at every generation they had their own way of expressing, uh, you know, their culture, their emotions, their moods. Uh, I think all this were captured in very pictorial ways. You know, if you look at more recently, maybe Ravi Varma paintings. So everything had, you know, when you look into those uh, artworks, it 
kind of brings back to you an appreciation of how the past was and it forms a point of reference for our current lives and maybe future also you know so art has that uh, the importance of art in society is that you know it forms a reference point for for us to move on uh, you know or even compare where we are versus what happened in the past so having said that now how does lighting design how can lighting design take on that role uh, to a certain degree uh, you know because uh, not many people might consider lighting design as an art because art is always at times thought to thought of as something stationary you know which you go to a museum and see a sculpture you know you see a statue you see an artwork and and you move on you know uh, you, you don't see art in your midst uh, you know in in your day to day life so this is where i think lighting as a medium really changes the game uh, in terms of where a commoner can really get get himself merged into uh, what we can call as art you know and art uh, art as such should create or evoke a sense of experience uh, when i go back home i should feel that i'm carrying back a sense of memory of that space uh, i think if it does all that then i would call that lighting design as something which has been artistically uh, thought through you know so i mean this is the best i think i can explain or i'm trying to put words into uh, that process uh, so even uh, even in my journey uh, it, it, it's not like from day one you became very artistic so it's it's learning from peers learning from the real big guys out of the market uh, on understanding how they applied light uh, how they are how uh, you know or even visiting spaces when you travel around when you visit spaces you really try to figure out uh, you know how each effect and how that user experience has been created uh, so i think through that journey we also try to bring in into our uh, work uh, you know these nuances of uh, lighting design uh you know talking about uh, specific about a few projects uh this was uh, a project on 3 4 years back in chennai uh, for a shopping mall uh, developer phoenix market city so when they were planning to launch their palladium uh, brand in chennai so chennai as such has been always i mean it's it's big on manufacturing and it but from a retail or from a a uh, consumeristic point of view it's still considered a laggard uh, compared to bangalore or you know like a high street is not really there uh, or was not there at that point of time so uh, this design uh, process uh, number one we chose a grazing method purely because the facade itself was a very interesting kind of a zinc a 3d kind of an uh, effect on that facade itself for so the material material materials were very interesting to look at so we figured out the grazing was the best method to really bring out that uh, the form or the, or the facade uh, envelope of that space uh, and then uh, decided okay now how should we light up the space uh, what should uh, this as a landmark uh, in that city uh, you know how 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 it should react or how it should be a part of that urban fabric uh, so that was the second thinking Uh, and that's when we thought okay you know what we need colors we need color changing number one as a part, uh, as something which stands out it's it's a unique property it's uh, it's a whole different you know all those retail shops inside this building is all high end you know uh, stuff so uh, i'm sorry i didn't share a few of those internal pictures as well so we brought in a lot of these colored elements uh, internally as well uh, uh, so that somebody who sees this from outside as they move inside they have elements of color and transition of color uh, during the entire journey from outside to inside so that was one of the thinking uh, of this project uh, next slide please uh, garo uh, garo can you move to the next slide please this is the next slide can you see the screen ranjit no it's not updated yet on my screen. 
Well, I, but, I think we were a bit tight on time, so we'll have to... Second slide. I mean, I, I don't know whether everyone can see. Can everyone... Yeah, now the screen changed. Yeah. So can... Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, these are... Uh, yes, okay. So that another couple of slides I have are of resident residential. Every year we keep getting some a few residential projects to do. And uh, the good thing about residential projects is that uh, one, uh, if the client is uh, well traveled and you know uh, has quite a wider or or I would say a deeper pocket, we are able to experiment a little bit uh, on the lighting design. Uh, they are. Uh, so I think that that's something which we found uh, interesting about uh, residential projects. You know? But though it might be a little cumbersome because uh, it's a lot of variations uh, in terms of a lot of people, a lot of decision makers, the husband, the wife, the children, uh, customizations. Uh, then these people also travel a lot. Uh, so they, they bring in, there's always a flux of ideas, you know, so even when the ceiling is getting uh, set up uh, there is a change of idea there's a new light fixture they like and they want to put it into their space so these are the you know the the, the practical uh, challenges i have faced but then uh, i've loved always working on landscape and exterior lighting so in here in this project if you look at that the middle slide uh, we use around uh, i think around six numbers of spotlights you know and and a couple of bollards you know where, hidden in various you know spaces to really create that uh, imagery of sorts, you know, kind of an orchestration of that space, uh, you know, just having a clear balance of light and shadow, uh, even if you look at that rock there, you know. So these are things which we love to do because we have to really come to the site and set this up. So uh, that is again a challenge. I don't know how this might look right now because it's been two years, but at least uh, for the photo shot, <laughs> it was like this. Uh, so that's also, I mean, we don't have, you may not have uh, people to really take care of these things uh, for a residential project. You know, after some time, something burns off. Uh, we are not sure how we are dealing with it. Uh, yeah, so that's, this is a, this was a main entrance. Uh, that's another uh, large uh, residential property, which we were involved with. Uh, again here, uh, so this was already a, this was a project, which was a more than, I think, this garden, this, uh, the owner of this project uh, built this home uh, around 15 years ago and uh, all the lights burned off and then they called us uh, on board to do a relighting of this whole thing. So it's, it was a one acre property of a lot of uh, landscapes and water bodies. Uh, and it's it was very uh, interesting because we hardly get fully grown landscapes to really do lighting on because most of the new projects, uh, most of the trees are like baby trees. Uh, or if at all they have a nursery, it's just a few trees that they, you know, bring from somewhere else and plant it here to the landscape. But this was very interesting because we had really grown palms and, you know, all those flowering and ponds and lotuses. Uh, so that's that's one of the pictures there, the lotuses uh, on the, uh, you know, floating in the pond. So here again, we, uh, I think it was more of a creation of the drama and wherever we look at. So uh, I think the kind of a philosophy I followed here was as we move in, you know, there are, there are these walking tracks, there are these vehicle, vehicular uh, roadways. So as we move around, how do we want to see, you know, how, what should be seen, what should not be seen. I think that's kind of drove the whole idea behind what to light and what not to light, you know. Uh, so we were actually uh, picking up each tree and understanding uh, the texture of the bark, uh, the texture of the leaves, uh, and you know, studying that in detail. Next slide, please. Taro, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, I think it's slow. You should be able to see it by now. Okay. Can you see the next slide? So, so again, yeah, right. So this is in Bangalore uh, for an IT park. Uh, they hired us here to, because this also was a built project. And uh, for some reason, they did not think about lighting for their common spaces. Uh, and so they brought us on board, said, hey, we just found that we did not do any thinking for the common you know, outdoor spaces. So can how do you rejuvenate or invigorate this space? Uh, 
so we worked with the architect. So, so the architect was there. Uh, he was trying to redo, you know, because you can't break anything. You already have a lawn. You already have these facades. So now it was more of a retrofit kind of a lighting design project. Uh, so, but what what drove again was you know, if you look at the left top corner, so that that was like a seat, uh, you know, eating space, you know, middle of a, a lawn, and they called it the maze garden. So we found okay, it's called the maze garden. So why is it called a maze garden? Uh, so then we found that okay, you know, it's got all these interesting uh, ways that these tables are laid out, uh, and these separations of these grass shoots. Uh, which kind of reminds you of a maze. Uh, so then the idea was, okay, let's you know do something in lighting which kind of resonates with that whole idea of maze itself. So hence the idea of those L-shaped lights, which again is not in a single direction, but it just kind of changes here and there you know, throughout you go. So uh, at any point you said you, you have these lights, certain lights uh, facing away from you, certain lights facing you. Uh, it, it's kind of a confusion, no? like like a maze itself. So that was the whole idea that we wanted to uh, portray there. Uh, these are certain other images uh, of that same spaces. Uh, so this this overall, it had to be a space where the IT people had to come out and really utilize the space. You know, sit out there, chat. It's more of a social space. So we ensured that there's not too many uh, pole lights and stuff because there's a lot of uh, fill light from all these glass facades. You know, which was anyway lighting up this. Uh, whole space to quite a decent lux levels. Uh, so we just used lighting in a very uh, specific to spaces, like for example, that water body there, or lighting up those vertical surfaces. We uh, stayed away from doing uh, generic lighting there. Yeah. Next slide, please. Uh, this is another uh, residential project which we were involved with. Uh, so it is not uh, quite right. often. So that, uh, 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 to... Yeah, I think we're a little tight on time. Okay. All right. So then, uh, yeah. Uh, so I'll I'd like quickly. To... Yeah. You want to open up for questions? Yes, I want to open up a discussion, but before that, Ranjit, I won't let you go away so quickly. So I have a question. I really liked, you know, what you were sharing about, uh, uh, you know, your thoughts on how to make an art which person who is walking on the street can take back as a memory. I think that really appealed to me. Uh, how often are you, as a lighting designer, able to convince your client to get into that space and to allow you to do that and uh, do you do you encounter situations where the clients come back to compliant then you, uh, this is extra extra cost uh, you know we, we all we all face that but i think that's a very interesting thought process that you have a bit about that yeah so it's quite, uh, since we are talking about lighting and art, uh, the real, uh, see now, we have never had instances where you commission artists, like a painter, and then you have a purchase manager who buys the oil paint and brushes for him, right? He brings his tools to the game. You you are bothered mm -hmm. only about the end product that he delivers, you know? he's He does a mural work, he does, an, he does a sculpture. A client will never buy a stone saying, okay, you know, let's get the cheapest granite out here, you know, to save cost. But unfortunately, the lighting, whatever we talk about design and art and all this, ultimately, it's it ends up in an Excel sheet. It's been decided by, you know, I'm talking about bigger projects, you know, when it comes to a, uh, you know, not not the residential types, but more of the commercial types. So in, in the residential, uh, to answer your question, uh, I think it's more easier to convince because, for example, something like this, what you see on the screen, the client was very hesitant uh, to bring in colors to the home. Uh, but then since we said, okay, you know, if you don't want color, you always have a white uh, option, uh, you know, so that you don't have to feel uncomfortable, uh, you know, because when you start uh, ideating about this, when you uh, think about, okay, color, their idea of color might be a, ho a whole, um, you know, kind of a very uh, a jarring uh, colored 
you know, uncomfortable environment. But then when you mix color with, uh, with white light, now, for example, even in the bottom, that uh, dining room you see, uh, uh, so there's a, there's a hint of uh, blue coming in from reflected from the wall. Uh, and then it fills in that space. There's also enough uh, white light which lights up your food and everything. So it's it's a it's, it's a mix of uh, you know color and uh, uh, white light, uh, which creates a, a, a kind of a different dynamics to that space. Uh, but uh, the client was hesitant, but then he had the budget because it was RGB DMX. Uh, it needs a much more investment. Uh, so he was ready to go ahead. Uh, but he liked the whole thing. I mean, uh, at some point, uh, I think he started appreciating that this can be used in certain uh, you know nights or when he's uh, when he's got uh, people home, uh, like a guest uh, stuff. So these kind of uh, small small things, I don't think people are uh, much worried. But uh, when it comes to a larger, uh, when you when you drive too much into now recently we are working on a project. Uh, so it, it ends up us asking really the client, you know, if you are you are building a 10 million square feet uh, building, uh, what do you think uh, would be a best way that how much can you spend? You know, uh, so this it all comes down to the numbers at end of the day. So they they work with some um, you know prehistoric uh, uh, budgetary figures. <laughs> so, um, but in today's world, uh, when you want to push your boundaries. Uh, you definitely have to go for a little bit of LEDs, a little bit of programming, a little bit of color change. Uh, I think these are essential to create a, a different, uh, you know, urban uh, night night setting. Uh, but then it's these are expensive. Uh, but they come on board with a preconceived idea of some uh, random numbers. Uh, so it's uh, so when it comes to the number talk, it's a little difficult. But then uh, as we move forward, when you do a demo, when we show. Uh, uh, you know, images, uh, uh, you know, from maybe international projects or something like that, they, they can maybe warm up to that idea. So uh, I would say the hit rates are uh, pretty low uh, <laughs> overall. Actually, this is one thing where we uh, need lighting designers that uh, if the desired look is going above the budget, that the lighting designers are there to do the value engineering and achieve the desired look within the budget or maybe come closer to the budget. Yes, no, undoubtedly. That that usually happens in every project that we have to value engineer no, so, the project. So, uh, so the um, see, Parvez, uh, I I we, I think I'm going to be debating on this for a long time because this budget thing, you know, when when you hire a lighting designer, you should allow the lighting designer to fix the budget, you know, at some point. But then you hire a lighting designer, and then you say you work within this boundary. Uh, without uh, any uh, uh, flexibility, at times it's you cannot push the because see if you look at facade lighting, why should you light up a facade? You know that's the number one question that I I would ask someone. Why would you light up a facade? Okay, you have something. You have a brand. And let me something. Basically, the consultant has to do in any consultant, maybe facade consulting consulting sound designer lighting design but these are the consultants generally where they assist us and the desired obviously architects also or interior designers also if we have closed on the concept as look and feel or anything the desired outcome which is required obviously there is a consultant to achieve to help you realize that our desired outcome and also there has to be some number which is the budget to the project, we have to design within that also the two things to achieve the desired outcome within the budget. This is required in every project, maybe construction project, architecture, interior design, facade or anything. And that is the reason this is one of the thing, one of the uh, a scope of any consultant or a designer, even in lighting designing uh, also the value engineering that uh, we are, if a car, we are not uh, like uh, lighting design, if we give something to design as a company and they care they have to come up with the fixture that these are the fixtures you can use so uh, there's a situation that they might not go as the desired look or they might select the their luminous or the number of luminous number of light to achieve the desired look and also considering the budget we can also consider between the companies uh, going for the top end company or the similar product is available from different company, which is achievable within the budget. So that kind of value engineering is required, which is obviously done by all the consultants. 
like yeah so uh, 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 what uh, you know what i would like to add here is i mean uh, i understand your point but what i would like to add is that crafting of that budget you know because you mm. mentioned that you have created uh, in your mind uh, how this building should look like and then you hire a consultant to achieve it but uh, i would recommend that you know to really uh, uh, you know get the benefit of a lighting designer it's important that you craft that story along with him you exactly. know so that see budget cannot be cut down to 50% the numbers cannot be kept uh, cut down to 50% yeah everybody understands that uh, if there is a value injury value injury will bring down to certain intensity certain can numbers not to 50 percent number those kind of bigger figures basically no, I, i'm not even talking about uh, i'm not even talking about value engineering what i'm saying is why, why do we even have to think about value engineering when it is being uh, you know factored in from the very in, see as you uh, create your form you know mm -hmm. as you uh, in your mind that first genesis of your thought arrives about your building that's the right time where that a confluence of ideas from a lighting designer to an architect should start evolving so exactly. that the budget budget automatically evolves out of the design yes but so i have to interrupt here i have to interrupt here that lighting is one of the low hanging fruits and it's you know, so if a structural engineer says that you can't cut down the budget because it's not structurally safe for your building if you reduce the budget no one will touch his budget but it's very easy for lighting budgets to cut down and we face right. it in all our projects true but true it's unfortunate that at the beginning of the project not much attention is paid uh the lighting consultant project it's only when they're not able to work on the light you know so this happens a lot of times i think it's still an evolving profession the way i look at it i mean we are in the business for just a few years it would be unfortunate to i mean it would be hard to say even that we are few decades in india especially you know so it will and will come a time where you know we will have the front seats to the show but i believe we are not there yet so uh, thank you very much i think that's that's a great uh, discussion that we were talking about uh, the budget uh amit and anusha do you have uh, anything to add to this uh, it would be also interesting to get your perspective on uh, you know the, the images that we shared and the conversations that we've been having uh, starting with you anusha yeah uh, i think that it's a tight rope walk um, if you talk about value engineering for me personally because uh, one is a, a we have to preserve uh, you know really control the intent as well like really preserve the intent but as well as b we have a budget yes even though it's a notion given by the client but then i think we as consultant are there to say how realistic it is like what percentage of okay if they are talking about 50% of my expectation i would i would be there as a expert to justify why it cannot be 50% and where it can be bridged up so that you can make the balance between the two i think uh, that would be a very uh, important um, contribution that i would probably give as a consultant yeah no totally agree amit your perspectives on this so this is a very tricky topic because first of all the light costing also jumps so much and specifications and planning is very critical and like gaurav you were saying earlier that you were speaking about structure a building cannot open without structure but a building can open without lighting absolutely and lighting i think the discussion between ranjit and praves which was happening i've seen in a 200 room hotel where the client had allocated 15 lakh rupees budget for a lighting facade lighting or in multiple projects i've seen not just one project it's i think ignorance at times and also with pmcs on board so the valuation i think where uh, ranjit was coming the budgeting done is absolutely wrong at times so you cannot have 200 uh, room hotel with a budget of 3 crore for all indoor outdoor lighting everything together so this problem happens but i think it's not done because uh, they want to create a mess in the project but it's just like you said it's a new profession people are still getting the hang of it and there's a very big uh, difference in terms of same specification and different costing of the products but i think as architects you know it's uh, 
a part of the parcel. We need to optimize, rationalize, and deliver the product to high quality. So I think it's finding a balance in the end between all these elements.